<laughs> so welcome to the sixth annual Northwest Teaching for Social Justice Conference. Mm -hmm. Before I begin, I think it's best for us to respectfully acknowledge the past and traditional owners of this land on which we're meeting, the Duwamish people. It is a, it is a privilege to be standing on Duwamish territory. Thank you. Now, every, everywhere in this world and in this society, we are assaulted by the triplets of greed, militarism, and profit motives. Now, more than ever, we need to keep alive a vision of education that attempts to build a better society. The Northwest Teachers for Social Justice Conference is a festival of hope and solidarity and knowledge sharing created by a, a group of mostly teachers from Seattle to Portland who volunteer their time to create a space where we can share a vision of that better society that public schools offer. Now, to paraphrase Paulo Freire from his book, Pedagogy of Freedom, we cannot be teachers if we do not perceive with ever greater clarity that our practice de de demands of us a definition about where we stand. And this is an opportunity to do that. Now, first, I'd like to thank the names of the following organizations. Puget Sound Rethinking Schools, Portland Area of Rethinking Schools, Portland and Seattle Chapters of Social Equality Educators, the Oregon Writing Project at Lewis Clark College, Oregon Save Our Schools, and Rethinking Schools Magazine. Please give a round of applause. Mm -hmm. All right. So now, as we make our way to our day, I would like to introduce Sel's wonderful principal, Aida Fraser Hammond. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am so excited to see so many of you here this morning and so excited to welcome you to the sixth annual conference for teaching of social justice. It is great to be here. I'm excited also that as the day goes on and the fog goes away, that your level of enthusiasm and excitement here is gonna burn it all away. And you guys are gonna have a great day. This is a great school, great facilities, and I'm so honored and proud that you are here and that we can host you. I hope you enjoy our facilities, and I hope that as you go through the day, you are going to look upon this school just the same way that I do, with love and pride, because it is a great school. Great teachers, some of whom have worked hard to put together this very conference for you. I applaud them, so join me, please. and also some of whom are going to enjoy the conference with you because there's a lot to learn from the presenters who are going to give us some enlightenment today. Also, from the guest speaker that we have this morning, you're going to enjoy it. And so without any further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Alex Bautista from El Centro de la Raza, who's gonna talk about him. And remember, mi escuela is tu escuela. My school is your school. Thank you. Buenos dias, como están? Viva Chief Self! Viva Curtis Acosta! <laughs> Buenos dias, good morning. How's everybody doing today? All right, well welcome to Chief Self. This is, I feel this is my home. I've been here, um, I've been uh, coming out to the school working with Proyecto Saber for the past 14 years, so it is an honor and a joy to be here this morning. We have a great, great presenter for you this morning. Uh, Curtis Acosta has taught high school in Tucson for nearly 20 years, where he developed and taught Chicano Latino literature classes for the renowned Mexican American Studies program in Tucson. He is an award-winning educator that has been featured in the documentary Precious Knowledge, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and his classes were subject to multiple profiles by CNN, the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, amongst many other media outlets, and is greatly loved in the community. Curtis received his Bachelor's of Arts from Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, 
He later obtained a Master's of Arts degree in Language, Reading, and Culture from the University of Arizona in Tucson, where he is currently pursuing his doctorate degree in Teaching, Learning, and Social Cultural Studies. Founder of Acosta Latino Learning Partnership, he strives to empower young people and us as educators, teachers, to work towards liberation, equality, and justice. Please welcome to Chief Self, Curtis Acosta. Thank you, Armando. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, that uh, Alex, for the introduction, brother. It um, means a lot to me um, and for showing up to listen to me. Probably, hopefully, you're showing up for the, the, other, uh, the other folks. And this is just, you know, you, got, you, you needed some coffee to get you, get you stirring. I'm going to get you stirred up a little bit. So um, let's make that happen. Uh, I'd like to also humbly thank uh, um, um, the organizers of the Northwest Teaching for Social Justice Conference for asking me to, to, to spend this time with you today. It's an absolute honor. Um, I've, been, I've been in the lab working on this talk. And it's 90 minutes long, and I got like four, 30 minutes to do it. So, uh, so please be, uh, please be uh, uh, um, kind to me. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, some of you know about our story. Some of you know about, um, about uh, the fact that it was, it's been, you know, standing up for our students, standing up against the, uh, you know, the forces of oppression and greed out there, um, that uh, it can be dangerous work. You know, the attorney general of my state's not a big fan, and standing up to the state superintendent of public instruction, it's dangerous sometimes. But you know what? No, I live dangerously. <laughs> the most dangerous thing I've ever done is I packed to come to Seattle without a raincoat. <laughs> yeah! Anyway, this talk's called uh, Pedagogies of Resiliency and Hope, and, and, I, and I hope we can, uh, we can spend some time today like recharging ourselves um, and, and having this like, you know, symbiotic, reflexive kind of moment where the energy coming out and back is just, is just uh, dynamic. So let's, if you don't mind, let's, let's start. We're gonna, we're gonna Follow the practices. I, I can, I, if I don't do this, I get all chueco. I get kind of crooked and twisted up. So this is how we started our classroom every day in uh, Tucson High, where I taught for nearly 18, uh, for, yeah, 16 of my 18 years, nearly 20 years, until, until I was banned from doing that. So my curriculum and my, my pedagogy and, 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 and my colleagues' curriculum pedagogy was banned. Um, so uh, our minds were put in prison, and so was our content the stuff that we had created. If you want to know more about that, it's the afternoon. So um, uh, I got a workshop. Anyway, but, but this is one of the things we set every morning. To, uh, to, and usually I have educators guess, but I, we don't have time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let you know that we would, we would use this indigenous Mayan phrase, all right? By the way, how many of you were, were born in North America? Raise your hand. All right, well, OK, three, four, no. <laughs> Uh, how many of you were born on planet Earth? Um, okay, should be the same hands, by the way. Um, good. So this indigenous Mayan knowledge is your history. You understand? And especially y'all from the West Side. I mean, Western Hemisphere. This is your history. So I share it with you, what I know of it, and I ask, you know, and you do with it what you will. So in La Cache literally means what you see there. Tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. And as you can see, Luis Valdez wrote this, this verse of a poem. And Luis Valdez is one of our greatest playwrights in the history of the United States. And those of you who know, he's a founder of Teatro Campesino. You, some of you know his tie with the United Farm Workers Movement and how important that was. And if you don't know, that's homework. So every day we would come to school, and I would say in La Cache, and then the students would jump in and say, Tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. Okay? And we, well, we would all say it together. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. After we start with the unity clap. Now, some people are all jacked up. They want to do it right now. No, there's, some, there's more, more directions. Right? So, I went to San Francisco uh, a year ago. Uh, they have a conference, T4SJ, m much like this one. Brothers and sisters in the struggle. Your, your conferences, in my opinion. Wonderful space. And I, I learned from some of my colegas out there who are doing ethnic studies in San Francisco uh, they're, they're Filipina Filipino. 
And they do the unity clap to start their classes too. And I was like, orale, that's sweet. But they added an element of their own kutura, which makes a lot of sense. Because the unity clap actually has a lot to do with the United Farm Workers' struggle, right? It's an homage to them. That's how they started their meetings. And a big part of that community that rode during those strikes, you know what I mean by ride, right? They rode, right? They, they supported, they were active. Now, yeah, anyways, I, 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 they, they were part of the strike, right? Were the Filipino community. That was the second largest group, Chicanos, Mexicanos, and Filipina Filipinos, right? So they added an element to the clap, which is dope. So I'm going I'm to teach it with you guys so you can use it. So it's Isang Bagsak. So Isang Bagsak, right, means in Tagalog, means one down. And, 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 and it's a movement kind of framework, too, context. So one thing accomplished. So what they do is they do the unity clap, right? And then when it gets all fast and kind of diffused, they go, Isang Bagsak. And then everybody goes, with one like, one like solidarity, one either stomp, clap, or grito, like a yell, all right? Now, I'm not going to like do a poll here. How many, gri how many gritos, gritos, all right? No, that's not the way my classroom worked either. You get in where you fit in, all right? So we're going to do the unity clap, and I'm going to say, Isan, Beksak, and we're going to go, boom, all right? One thing. Now, I rate my audiences, okay? <laughs> And, you, and the only one, only, I never tell anybody who's the best, but I do blow up the worst. <laughs> so you don't want to be that, Seattle, because that's Denver's spot. <laughs> and they're holding on to it like grim death. <laughs> All right? I, like, started my actual talk, and somebody did that. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I went, and don't dance with people in Denver. And I'm an activist. I was go, I'm going to warn people all over the country, don't dance with people in Denver. Or at your own risk. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fascist. <laughs> if you also like to live dangerously, dance with folks in Denver. All right. So we're going to clap it up. I'm going to go Isan Baksak. You're going to go boom. And then we're going to go right. I'm going to say in la cash. And then you're going to join me in saying tu eres mi otro yo. Now, some of you are really good with Spanish. Some of you are learning. Some of you are real good in Spanish. Be sensitive. All right? Some of you are really good at English. Some of you are, are learning, like me still, right? So be sensitive. All right, so we're going to roll it together. Y'all ready? All right, it's a good way to start. Let's do it. Ooh, that was good. Yeah, that was good. You didn't want to see caca face right there, right there. This is what it looks like. You want to say, he's like, <sighs> and then I give people a chance to do it again. That was good. All right. In la cash. You are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mi mismo. I do harm to myself. If I love and respect you, me amo y respeto yo. I love. See, I didn't want it. That was beautiful. Wasn't that nice? Isn't that a great way to start the morning? That was how we started class. Sometimes the bell hadn't rang yet. They would clap it up, and I would be getting my cafecito in the bathroom, and I'd be running in. Wait for me! <laughs> and sometimes we were running on Chicano time, and you know, the bell rang, and, you know, I know we got all sorts of times, island, CPT, all that, right? You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so that, we needed that for a number of reasons. To rehumanize the space, of course, right? That's the number one. And also, as we went through the struggle, as, as people attacked us, as they told us, those of us that were saying this, and not only saying this, living it and modeling it in our community, our students, our community members, our parents, and, our, and the teachers, they were calling us hateful people, racists, and all sorts of stuff, right? Because obviously we're anti-American, because there ain't no American up there. Right? Except for the, the native part of America, sin. Never mind. <laughs> so it was really important to remember that we weren't going to reflect that same hate back, that we were going to do this, that even though these folks were saying these things about us, that we were going to th still humanize them and see them as human beings. And that's why I was so proud of all of the th work that our youth did and we did. Were, were, was, was in that Gandhian, King, Huerta kind of framework, right? 
that, that, that peaceful framework, that peaceful intentions. In Lakesh is the way I call it. So anyway, I, I, I thought I'd give you a little context of where I'm from. So check this out. Down the oh, let's see a high riser. 63 NBA draft picks. An incredible defensive play here. Like he just palmed it right out of his hands. 29 conference champions. This was a magnificent play by Sean Elliott. 25 all American. Oh, throws it up the oh, it? Oh, 14 sweet 16. Bill 22A1, that we're going to outlaw Mexican American studies, indigenous studies, and we're going to ban you from teaching it. Oh, yeah, we are, this, this is Arizona, right? Yes to 1070. We, su we support Sheriff Joe. They don't. Um, you know, Arpaio and whatnot. Uh, come on, pictures. Here we go. You know, so we were, we've been under the, under the gun, right? Literally, like the militia and whatnot. Um, our state. This is Arizona, Arizona, where we, we've outlawed ethnic studies, where we have an ELD, English Language you know, Development Program. <laughs> I like that one, too. <laughs> um, that, that we have a four-hour block. We have a four-hour block where if you're an English, English language learner, like me right there, you see that? If you're an English language learner, you are segregated in the Mexican room, they used to call it back in the day, all right? For four hours straight of English immersion, reading and writing from the rest of the campus, from the rest of your homies. K-12. You can go to any Arizona school, a public school, and go and ask where that room is. You'll find it, unless they're, unless they're on the hustle. There's some smart people out there that hustle that stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, we're doing it in all our classes. Check it out. But, but not many. Most of the time, they're segregated. And of course, you know 1070. So my state, this is Arizona. And, and this is who we're talking about, correct? So we're talking about resiliency and hope, but we're also talking about the criminalization of scholars, the criminalization of youth, right? So this is the Dream Nine. Th these young people uh, were, so, were so brave this summer that they put with cap and gown and mortarboard on, right? And they went and deported them. They self-deported, self all right? And stared this government and this broken immigration policy right in the face. And so you must do something about this. But this is who we're criminalizing, right? These folks that years ago we would call what? Talented scholars and a resource to this country that we want to build and develop and invest in? Yeah, not, any, not in my state. That's not Arizona. But we're not, we are not alone. <laughs> George is here with you. Oh, Georgia, why'd you do it? Check out, how, check out how this looks so different. I showed my wife when I was putting this together. I go, hey, babe, look how different this is. And she was obviously not listening to me. She goes, yeah, yeah, it looks way different. <laughs> Damn, principals. They never listen to teachers. <laughs> not even in the cocina. <laughs> nah, that's just a, she's smart. That's a husband filter thing, right? She's a great principal. I'm, I'm a lucky man. My wife's awesome. Um, but but I, go, I go, babe, can you look at it again? That was a joke. And she's like, oh, my God, really? That's Georgia? Because it looks like a lot like what we did. So I don't know if you know this, but HB 87, I call it the hate child, right, of SB 1070, right, our papers, please, law in Arizona that, that, that made 
racial profiling legal, right? Just pull anybody over and ask them for their papers, right? Yeah, anybody that looks like my, uh, me uh, or darker probably, right? And, and then also, uh, so they took that and they took HB 2281, the one that they used to, to, to stop what we did. It's the beautiful work we were doing. And, and what they just said is like, let's get to students and Latinos. How do we do that? Well, we'll ban undocumented students, huh? Because huh? it's Georgia. The only uh, folks, that, uh, that's Latinos. The only Latinos there many times are our, the, our, our undocumented population. They're like, let's ban them from our top five universities. So you have valedictorians, you have artists, you have, uh, you have scholars, you have athletes that can't stay at home and go to school once they graduate. They could have ropes around their, their gowns, and they're not invested. That's it. You're done. Go. Go work for me. Go find a Starbucks. And unfortunately for this young man, it became Arizona. Yeah, we weren't alone. But that ain't, that's not it. You saw, this is Chicago too, right? You see these young people? They don't look all that different. They're human beings and young, like the ones you saw earlier, right? They may be a different shade. I blame that on the weather. But <laughs> you definitely, I mean, it does look a little different, Georgia and Arizona and these protests, right? And, you know, look at it. But if those of you, you know this. I don't need to tell you. I could put Philly up here, too. But like I said, this is a 90-minute talk. This right here, right? All those little red dots, those are schools closed. One year. Bam. No matter what the community said. This is the same spot, right, where this woman's a hero. Karen Lewis, she is. <laughs> right? I got to meet her this summer, right? Right? At Free Minds, Free People in Chicago. Free Minds, Free People. You should go. Anyways, um, so we were in Chicago, and, and this is the same woman that helped spearhead the community, the parents, the students, and the teachers to win a strike. To win a strike. Yeah, yeah woo! Yeah, I know that's you want to woo, but we ain't wooing, because the ne very next year, this is what happened. That same, you'd think with the same network put in place, that they'd be able to, no, no. The same policymakers that sat in Arizona, and that sit in Georgia, sit in Illinois, sit in Chicago, and they don't listen to people either. They don't listen to him. They don't listen to LaShawn, who I also met this summer. And you know, some people are like, well, they just, they just trained him to talk that good. <laughs> What's well, really talked that well? Stop watching Fox News. <laughs> right? So, so anyways, that's LaShawn, right? And he's like just as articulate, probably more so one-on-one -on -one than he is when he's addressing thousands of people in Chicago, they didn't listen to him either, right? So it's all, you know, and really they're punishing. They're still, that's, this, is, this is criminal in its own way because where they go when they're not in school, well, we're going to get there. We see this in America right now. This, you know, and I, I bring it back home to my context. Those are the, those are the state, the worst, by the way, did you find yourselves up there? You Oregon and Washington folks? Yeah, good job. So here we are, 50 years, right? We just celebrated the March on Washington for Freedom and Jobs. Like, oh, yeah, we made it. Yeah, we're in this great, beautiful thing. At the same time, all this nonsense is still happening, right? In fact, you know, the people keep talking about our progress. And the Pew Hispanic Research Center came up this, this summer and said Latino students, right, are graduating at a higher rate, right, in this context, too, than European-American students, right? graduating high school. So I did a little more digging. I go, well, what's that look like in college? Because once they're done there, where are they going, supposedly? Right? So this is from 2010, from the Pew Hispanic Research Center. Same thing. All right, this is from a study by uh, Richard Fry and Mark Hugo Lopez. And what you see here on the left is the bachelor's degrees in 2010. That's not too far away from the study that they just completed. Right? And what you see is 1.2 million bachelor degrees that were, that were awarded in 2010 were given to those of European descent. And you see 160,000 bachelor degrees given to folks of African American descent, and 140,000 degrees were obtained by students of Latino heritage. So where are we? In this, where's this post-racial thing, right? You don't keep hearing me challenging that, right? Because it goes back to that, that cartoon you just saw, right? You put, this, you, know, you put this together with the fact that we know in the past two decades, the money that states spend on prisons has risen at six times the rate of spending on higher education. Because that's where they're going, Jack. 
This is real talk. This prison industrial complex we got, right? Some of, this, some of the stats you're going to see right here are from the Cajun of America, all right? It came out in 2012 by Adam Gopnik in The New Yorker. And read this last one, because there's some shout-outs to Mel, uh, Michelle Alexander's work in a little bit, right? She does that better than me. Gopnik does, does it better than me. But I want to lay out this context for 2013 in America, right? Because I know sometimes we feel real good about ourselves around uh, about some, some issues. And we'll talk about that, too. But that idea of white supremacy is still happening, right? If you ever listen to the Daily Show clip about our program, Michael Hicks, a school board member in TUSD, the Hicks resolution is the resolution they used to kill us, right? They used the law, and then Hicks wrote the resolution. Yeah, wrote it. <laughs> Some guarantee somebody wrote it for him. But he said at the very end of that Daily Show interview, it's the Daily Show, ha, 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 he said, if there's no more white people left on the earth, if there's not one white person left on the earth, you can do what you want. Not one, and that's white, that, you know, we all laugh when we watch The Daily Show, but that's, that's white supremacy coming out of somebody's mouth who's an elected official in this country who has power over children. And we can all feel good watching The Daily Show and go, man, there are those rednecks in Arizona or whatever, but they're everywhere because this is the policies of our country. And Michelle Alexander calls this out in poop form, right? She does good scholarly work. And then I want you to, there's a convergence here. I, you know, Twitter, man, who knew? So yesterday I went, hey, I'm coming to Chief Self, right, on Twitter. And Tanya Gorsh Bosa tweets me back, my brother works there. I went, that's crazy, because I'm going to use you in my talk tomorrow. <laughs> All right. But check out, check out from her study, right? Check out what Elise Foley wrote in the Huffington Post. I, I, I put it, I highlighted it in yellow there, in case you couldn't see. I love that word removal. Not deportation. Deportation still has this kind of human element to it. It's ugly, but it's kind of human. But she said removal. I said, yeah, that's good. Like, like a cancerous tumor. We are taking these bodies, these 400,000 bodies, and removing them from our country. All right? Probably, most, you know, most of them hardworking. Most of them with families. Most of them with kids in our schools. Right? Removals. And where do they go? while they're being in the process of removing. Well, they're going to tell you right here. I don't have to tell you. They'll tell you. The Corrections Corporation of America in 2005 told you. I'll let you read that. It's pretty affecting. Because we're talking about profits. And I'm a big fan of M&Ms. I don't want M&Ms to slow down. You keep doing your capitalist thing, M&Ms. Because I'm going to buy you. Eat you with no hands kind of M&M's, you know, like, like a trough. <laughs> but what, what candy goodness M&M's can be, for these folks, it's our children's bodies. Our brothers and our sisters. Our tias and our tios. That's the peanut M&M for these people. And that's why it's a, five, that's a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry, and that's why they spend five million dollars, five million dollars a year on lobbying. And this is 2013. I didn't want to depress you too much, though. We had we, whew! See, it's, it's tough in this room, but check it out, right? Yeah, that, that's good. But, you know, I, I'm feeling my LGBTQ folks, you know, they're like, yeah, that's good, but the, don't you dare say that we're there yet. No, there's the map. Yeah, we're not close to there. I know. I know. But we're, we're, we're at least going that direction lately. Now, I'm just going to say you lately, not now, because now means permanent. I'm saying lately for a reason. You saw some of it already. But this is nice, though. So we need to bathe in this a little bit, right? So, you know, we, we have folks, we, we, we're pushing this conversation forward in such a way. LGBTQ, LGBTQ rights, I'm, I'm going fast here, sorry. And this is beautiful. This is love. Yes. Awesome. You know, so it's, this is incredible, right? In fact, it's working so well, apparently, that Time Magazine, like this movimento towards human rights and justice, Time Magazine called it, it's over. 
in, in, in a way, you know, only that, that's white privilege probably that could say, we can say it's over. All right, maybe, I hope so. I hope you're right. One of the proudest things that I, of, of, of the years I, I, did, uh, I had teaching and developing my Mexican-American studies uh, Chicano literature curriculum was the fact that I intentionally, uh, after learning in conferences like this and being challenged, I was always a safe space for my homies, right? I was a safe space because that's how I grew up. I grew up in the Bay Area, man, I'm my cousin, you know? My mentor in Tucson, my first mentor who loved me, he was gay. I was around fabulous gay men. And so I knew that I had to ride for them. But I had a conference in 2005 or 6, so when I was hanging out with one of the fellow conference goers who's gay, and he's like, Curtis, if you want to take it, if you're not teaching it, though, then you're part of this, right? Right? If you're, you're covertly supportive or passively supportive, you're really not. So I put that stuff in my curriculum, all right? And when they banned it, oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. How could you not? How could you talk about social justice for one group and not all? How can you rock in La Cash? <laughs> now that's hard to find though. It's hard to find the lit. No, it's not hard to find folks kissing. It's hard to find the literature. It's hard. So we got to make it easier on ourselves in conference like this to get this stuff going, right? And. Uh, but, but it was there. And you know what? When they banned it, and now they're writing new curriculum, and they have these new classes, right, that are in the grave of the classes that we have at Tucson High, that piece is missing. The youth piece is missing, and the LGBTQ piece is missing in that literature. And I'm not, I'm not slamming those people for whoever wrote it, but that wasn't what I did. That's not what my students got. They got humanizing all the way through. Not just through a Chicano lens, through a human lens, an in Cash lens. That's what we were about. So as you see stories of Mexican-American studies making a comeback, look at it with a, with a critical eye. How much of a comeback are we talking about? So we're going to have a little, you know, this became so popular, you know. Yeah. Just drink it in. Macklemore, Seattle, right? Yeah, you're lucky, man. I, I love Sir Mix a lot. Could have been that. <laughs> and I, blue, I love Blue Scholars, too. But I can't change. Come on. Even if I try, even if I wanted to, come on. My love, my love, my love, he keeps me warm. Yeah, you got to switch the gender. He keeps me warm. Don't be afraid. He keeps me warm. He keeps me warm. Wasn't that nice? <laughs> nice job. Nice job. Unfortunately, we got, I got to take you back, because this is 2013, too. And you don't know who that is. It's Trayvon Martin. And that is the man who murdered him. And that is Trayvon's disfigured body after he was murdered. And this one's going to kill you. Yeah. That's his father and him. in one of those loving embraces that we just sang together. Right? Same love. And unfortunately, Trayvon won't be able to do that with his own sons and his own daughter. He won't be able to, and, and, and Trayvon's father won't be able to do that with Trayvon's sons and daughters. So in 2013... A lot of us felt like that verdict was going to a place we'd seen before, giving permission to hunt black men, young black men. Hunt them. And for those of you that are a little older, older vintage than me, you know, with some canas, right? More salt than pepper. And you're from the African American community, you've been fighting this forever. This looks familiar too. This is Emmett Till. This is Billie Holiday singing about that strange fruit. And this is 2013, y'all. Same time we were singing Macklemore together. And this is 2013. What the hell is this? <laughs> Anybody know that guy's name? That caricature? Yeah, you do. Good. Chief Wahoo. But what I'm wondering, this is a Cleveland Indian mascot. What I'm wondering is why Chief Wahoo, why we're digging in for him so bad? Because he ain't going nowhere, according to the 
Cleveland Indian administration. And everybody knows about this battle going on. By the way, I was writing this up before it all got blown up. I, like, I, was, on the, I was on the beat, man. I told you. Sports is fascinating. Sports talk is fascinating. Because it gets you clued into 30 to 50 year old European American men, right? Mainstream middle class. Man, you're going to see some sports talk in a little bit. But this is Daniel Snyder. And I couldn't even, it's, this is so fluid, I couldn't get President Obama or the new letter by Daniel Snyder into this. I was like, sorry, man, I did that talk. I, I got that talk prepared for these people. All right, now it's just rehearsing it. But this is what people don't know is this is what the Bay Area looked like in 1970 because that's where I grew up, right? And this is, this is Philadelphia. What, what they gave us, we turned to this, right? San Francisco Warriors. My dad doesn't even remember that, by the way, because, well, in 1970, we turned it into that. I say we like I was alive. That was all over my peachy folder, uh, by the way. Yeah, I'm that old, right? Binders. Okay, binders were these... Never mind, young people. I don't even care. If I can't do binder, I can't do peachy folder, right? Yeah. So in 1970, the, the Golden State Warriors got rid of all that caca. And then, well, maybe you don't know this, our Pac-12 colleagues, right? That was what Stanford looked like. In 1972, the year I was born, that was the end of that. Look at that caricature from Stanford, that enlightened university. But they were enlightened because they got rid of it 41 years ago. And now it's this. Now, don't let, I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> All right. You're gonna go, you need to find somebody from Stanford to figure it. I'm not that smart. <laughs> oh, man. man. <laughs> Where are we, though? in 2013. So I thought I'd bring a little bit of Bill Simmons in here. All right? So go ahead and give that a read. All right? Bill Simmons has the sports, I told you, sports talk, right? This is where we can get a gauge of what, what, what middle class, uh, upper middle class possibly, European American men, 30 to 50. I know sports fans are way more than that, but not sports talk. Check out the demographics, okay? That's what I'm saying. I mean, I'm, come on, I'm not dumb. I'm a scholar. I'm not, you know, I know, I know everybody, tons of different sports fans. We are diverse, but not to talk about it Right, and I love this. I love this because you can see Bill trying here, right? But the, the first line is awesome. It's tough for me because I'm a white guy. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm doing this out of context, but I love saying that. Oh, man. <laughs> it's tough. <sighs> well, it's tough. <laughs> well, it's tough. <laughs> nah, that's mean. That's mean. That ain't in that cash, but it's funny. Yeah, so, no, but, but you see what it's tough for him to do. He's, he's trying to figure it out. And Dave Zirin, if you don't know Dave Zirin, this is who he's talking to. Dave Zirin writes for the nation. Yeah, he's dope. You can tell, read it. You can tell he's dope. And he's been on this Washington professional football team name for a while. See, I'm trying to retrain myself because I've been a football fan since I was, well, a sperm and an egg. But it's hard to, you know, when you say Washington, you want to say that horrible derogatory thing. That's what they do to us. It's just in us. So Dave Zirin says at the end here, check it out. I was on my bike, right? Riding my bike with my iPod on, and I'm like, dang, he said basic empathy. So I almost had a crash because I'm trying to find, like, I know I shouldn't be right. Yeah, I don't want to. I can't. There's plenty of things. I'm, I'm a contradiction. I shouldn't be doing that. It's not safe. I know, I know. My wife, I have a wife. That's okay. <laughs> but that think this sort of like, like, this sort of like, you can tell he's talking. This sort of like basic empathy is critical when you have these discussions. Basic empathy. Unfortunately, this is Bill's transition, right? Which he stays on it for a while, but then he brings up the Olympic argument is much more interesting. What? Now, if you don't know what he's referring to, the Olympic argument, he's talking about what's going on with, uh, with, the, with the Russian government and the Sochi Olympics and the fact that, that they're, they're homophobic you know, laws. I mean, it's, it's dehumanizing. It's, it's, it's scary, right? And so, but that, that, that's more interesting? We've got to watch our words. But, our, but maybe our words reveal something. Because I'm wondering what the heck's going on where we are so progressive in 2013 towards, towards uh, you know, this idea of love and the killing of the Defense of Marriage Act and all that caca that we're getting rid of. Yeah, but at the same time, you saw these slides, these other slides. What's going on here? Now, Thoreau, I mean, sorry, sorry, the F word. 
Dave, my boy Dave Stovall, my homeboy Dave Stovall, he'd say, this is the F word, Curtis, it's Foucault. <laughs> yeah. Foucault says something like this, we want historians to confirm our belief that the present rests upon profound intentions and immutable necessities. But the true historical sense confirms our existence among countless lost events without a landmark or a point of reference. Random. When I read that, I went, because I was like living this, right? How 50 years after Dr. King am I here advocating for Mexican-American studies? And why is this happening? And I read that and I went, damn. <laughs> but we're still here. We've always been here. So I went to another, like Foucault, I went to another real, real scholar that I love and I think is a genius. And he said this. Sometimes we get like... That's your challenge. Put that on a wall. <laughs> I'm a Scott man. I was trained right. My, my, you know, my committee would be proud of me. You cite everything. <laughs> so sometimes, as lovely as these conferences are, we get caught up. The speakers get caught up because they're my homies in this neoliberal attack and neoliberal agenda. But yo, SA, it's about racism too. También, man. Orale. This sucks. So we got to call it what it is. It's, it's this, I'm not, I'm not minimizing neoliberalism. I'm putting racism back on the, on, on, the, on the chessboard and in the center because, well, we've seen it. And what happened to this? What happened to this ethic of cross, ethic of cross ethnic empathy that in Lakesh embodies? Because back in the 50s and the 60s, we had buses going down to Georgia. And they know buses for those young people. We had SNCC. We had the Freedom Riders, right? Yes. We didn't just romanticize that. Nobody fictionalized that and made that up, right? It really happened, right? Well, where is it now? Well, there weren't buses. There was one bus that came to Tucson. It was filled with Rasa, right? Educators. And they had books with them. The Libro Traficante Movement. All right. Tony Diaz. He smuggled in books. Libro, libro, traficante. Traficante, right? Like a trafficker, right? And they smuggled books in. It was a wonderful event, right? But those were the buses coming down. Now, I know there's advocacy up here, all kinds. I'm not saying that, but we, is it enough? Are we doing enough? Because this is going to hit close to home, I hope. This was my program. This was the program I was a part of. These are all my students, right? Check out, check out that data. Because that's what they make us do. Look at the data. Look at the data, right? Right? And then you even run some of this. Like, we, we, we're in a desegregation order for 30 years, so there's new special master. Dr. Willis Hawley, he had the University of Arizona run all these, like, the most, the most rigorous uh, 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 um, research models possible, right, to find out our effectiveness. And we were killing it. We were killing it. I don't like all that gobbledygook. I like this. I got to see my young people go, they're like, well, it was biased. It was biased. What the hell? You know, like, you know, like, you know, they're trying to like, no, I watched them walk across the stage in red, you know, strawberry, like, you know, cap and gown, get that diploma. That's not like cooking the books. That's, that's a kid graduating. And I know because the qualitative data, that means the authentic relationship between me and that student, they said, if it wasn't for these classes, I wouldn't have done it. I love you, and I love them too. Right? <laughs> but it didn't save us. Data didn't save us. And I tell this to my homeboy, well, you'll see him in a second. I tweet it because I don't have a chance to see him because he's way up here. What are we really talking about? Because this is Seattle. There's my homeboy Jesse. You all know the data don't matter. Garfield knew what was up. They're like, you know, F this test. And I ain't talking about Foucault. <laughs> I saw scrap the map buttons. You guys know what's up. Because you know what? If it's so good, all this data and this and that and the other thing, uh, then what's going on? Why is my program dead? If it's really a neoliberal attack, how are they profiting off of 
the end of my, my students' dreams in Mexican-American studies and the work they were doing. Really? What's going on here? Now let's talk about... I got to skip that because we're running out of time. Oh, you can tell the organizers you want more time with me. <laughs> and those of you that have workshops later, you can go, that's right, I'll give them five minutes. You can voice your opinion. All right, mom, we're going to skip it then. I wasn't lying. So that, that bottle there, by the way. Now let's talk about something a little more. That's John Hoopatal, State Superintendent of Public Construction. I'll play a little uh, bit of it, because I think Paul going to give me a little bit more. Program. Uh, this was something that was sort of you inherited as you came into office. Uh, you created, I believe, a commission to study that or a board to study that. They reported back, and now the decision has come down that Tucson is out of compliance, and they stand to lose funding if they don't pull that program. Program. Bring us up to date. Where are we and what does the future look like? Well, one thing I want to tell people a little bit about what our strategy was. We, when we came into office, we felt like we had to do a professional job. And we also know that in these kind of situations, you can very quickly, as a conservative, end up with a lot of forces against you and you can be defeated in your mission. And we count, we don't we don't we're not we don't feel like we're in the entertainment business we are in the winning values business and so we very carefully laid out our strategy and when we were doing this i thought back on how i had read about conflicts in over time you know and, and it's a military analogy but i you know i did a little reading on the romans and when queen Boudicca encountered the romans in england she just attacked and boy it was one heck of a charge it was with the full glory and everything and she got slaughtered the, she outnumbered the romans five to one and they completely killed everybody and uh... so when we encountered this situation we did what hannibal did to the romans and when hannibal encountered the romans he stretched them out and so what we did is we took the time to very carefully at a minute level look at the evidence in detail and build our case a finite element by finite element and so we elaborately built our case we stretched them out for a whole year during that year they lost an enormous number of their mexican-american study students they had to continue to defend themselves in the press so and then when we finally encountered them in court it was a knockout punch and we were able to clearly convince us uh, present our case I got to cut a little bit short, but did you hear some of this? Well, you're going to see it too. Check out this rhetoric. And what you missed at the end is he goes, you know, they're disparaging, you know, our, our founders, right? Those are my guiding lights, you know? And we never, we never disparaged them. We humanized them. Yeah, we took them off this mythology that he had. So you don't hear him at the end. He said, the forces of collectivism are, are suffocating us. It's the eternal battle of all time. The forces of collectivism versus the forces of liberty. Yeah, he says this stuff. And, the re and the, 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 sometimes the, the, um, the reaction is, you're, though you have crazy folks in Arizona, and hopefully this whole presentation showed you that it's everywhere. Don't think you're not, you don't have these folks here, because that's naive. I don't teach that. And this is the military analogy. This is the opposing force that he was talking about. Children. Right? His rhetoric. You know, Foucault said, if this form of management power is not totally entrusted to someone who would exercise it alone over others in absolute fashion, rather this machine is one in which everyone is caught, those exercise the power as well as those who are subjected to it. That's, it, that's in like Gesh right there. We got to humanize Hupenthal, even though he's going to war against that picture. And this is illegal. And this is criminalized in this country. And don't think it's not criminalized here because there's a border just up the road where it's still, that still matters. Right? Well, so I go to my guiding lights. I went to DJ Cool Heart. Because those vatos there that went after us and eventually did get our program, 
They aren't keeping it real, and they're not keeping it right. And so many times, you know, Herc was really talking about, in the context, if you read this in Jeff Chang's book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, Herc's talking about, you know, Jay. He's talking about Kanye. But, you know, and a lot of times people are like, well, what are they doing? They need to do more. No, those vatos need to do more. We need to call them out. Don't get all high and mighty when these folks are ruining the lives and going to war against our children and put them in prison and criminalizing them going to school, right? So this is what happens when you negotiate with terrorists. So the new curriculum I told you about, it's a Mexican-American studies course with no Mexican-American authors nor Latino authors until they got embarrassed by the folks in our, at home who are still fighting this battle in the media that exposed them. And I love this because Tony Diaz is like, warning at the bottom here, this post contains mind-altering thoughts banned in Arizona. <laughs> this is what happens when you negotiate with fools that think like that, right? Even though I'm humanizing them, they are fools, that's okay. That's in La Quiche too. So I go to this Gladwell quote, and I got about five minutes, so I'm going to sprint through this last part, because this is the pedagogies of hope. I want you to take that thing. I thought this was fascinating, the idea. I've always thought that the paradox of industry is in decline. I want you to think of institutions in decline. Because in Arizona, when, when, a, when a, we had to do a professional job as a head of schools, guess what? Your institution is in decline. Our state superintendent that talks that way about children, we're jacked up. But, but this nation's getting jacked up about education, right? What does he say? We get less innovative, Gladwell, right? Gladwell's a smart dude. We get less innovative, right? We get more conservative. Isn't that, isn't that these tests that you're boycotting? Right? Isn't that what that is? It's, it's real teacher-proof teacher curriculum, scripting everything. We were innovative. What happened to us? Coitons, right? <laughs> So we got to watch, I, but I don't believe in that. I believe in us. I believe if we keep, if we, we don't do hand wringing and things like that. So another one of my guiding lights said this, right? Because in the, and I think you can, we can find, even though I'm up in this nice Northwest where everybody's green, everybody's like trying to keep it real with green. I hope you keep it real with brown and red and black too. <laughs> All right? Real talk. But sometimes in the red, red states where I'm from and in Georgia, that's where we get these, these pedagogies of hope. In the darkest places, you see the springs of optimism. So do you know about Freedom University? If you don't, after the banning of the five, the, the students from the five schools, three University of Georgia professors just go, well, you know what, we're going to do school on a Sunday. We're going to do school on a Sunday and we're going to give that education out. And we're not going to tell you where the school is, by the way, because otherwise you're going to come with ice. We know that. We're going to keep it shady. They learned that from what? From the freedom schools, right? And, where, and once I left TUSD, where did I find myself as soon as Freedom University started again? That's right, right there teaching. All right? I got on the plane. It ain't a bus, but I got on the plane because I owed them. And I'm going to tell you why I owed them, right? Because I wanted, they, they inspire me, that courage to go to school, to keep it up, a space to act, to, to still be, to organize and still to be activists. Because that's really what I have to do to that picture. Check out the privilege. And look at their teacher, man. One of their major teachers right there. There's the cross-ethnic empathy, right? There's my homeboy, Matt Hicks. That's my brother. I love that man. Because he loves those kids that you can't see their beautiful faces. He loves them like they're his children. He rides for them. You can see the privilege. It's Matt. It's me. All right? And Dalia was very clear. She's like, Mr. Acosta, I got my papers. You can show my face. But I should have a picture, and we do have pictures, but I can't show them to you because I never know who's in the audience, right? Malcolm taught me that. So this is what I want to show you about Pedagogies of Hope. Freedom University, well, guess what? They inspired class. So I did the same. Sundays, last year, August through May, every Sunday at the local youth center, we kept it alive for free. And there are my youth presenting at Chicago. You know why? Because they decided they wanted to go, and I had to find the money. <laughs> and 
and I found most of the money in my checking account. <laughs> and I don't have much there. But I'll show you why I could, I could give them some, uh, a, a chunk. There they are at Radical PD. They're, not, they're, 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 they're holding court with a bunch of teachers. And the, look at those teachers. They're listening. That's what they should be doing, right? Because they want to know what makes these young ones so powerful. So this is what happened. Check that out. So you start something because you're indignant, as Paulo Freire would say, and beautiful things happen. So Prescott College said, you want, free co sorry, you want college credit? I go, you keep it free because Sunday's free, yo. They're like, we can't do that. I go, give me the mechanism. So we did. We raised funds. And then they had to pay me. They had to legally pay me. So that's where we got the money to go to Chicago. <laughs> not, not all of it, but you know, I, you know that's, what you, that's the way you ride. You either, you are, you're on the bus or you're not on the bus is today's talk, right? <laughs> so this is still legal. This is now, this is now college credit. These books here that are banned and were, some of them were boxed, they're still happening. We're reading them. We're free. Except for, I now have a class of 10 or 15. It used to be 180. But you know what? It used to, it really means zero. It was really zero because they think, they, they thought they got over on us, right? Juno always takes a while to get up there. Right? But, but we, we're all right. And that's, what's, that's what the end of the talk here is. We started this institute. I'm going to go through this real quick. You can get us on Facebook, right? Because now we got an institute that class is sponsoring all through. That's, I'm sorry. Inst our institute is sponsoring class. And guess what we're going to do with this institute? We're going to teach teachers what we were doing and organizing. <laughs> right? <laughs> to empower you to take over. All right? So if you want to know more about that, I'll get past all the people. If you want to know more about that, then you come over here. Well, we'll get there. Right here. You go, our, there's our institute uh, email, Facebook. It's also .org, Chito, right? And if you want to get to, if you want my contact information, oh, did, did you get that down? All right, sorry, I'm sorry. Give me two, two seconds, all right. So this is, we're going to keep doing these workshops. Right now they're a little spendy, because guess what? We're using that to pay for class now. Eventually we'll want to get foundation money. we get some sponsorship. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to have a national day of social media where we reach out to Eva Longoria and say, yo, one night, Eva, can you do a benefit? Because she was really horrified by what happened to us. Well, give us one night, and you probably pay for class five, for five years. And we're going to, if, if you guys come to our Facebook and stuff, we're going to organize that, and we're all going to tweet her nicely, and not creepy either. Don't be looking for no dates. <laughs> and I am down with the same love, so I'm talking to all y'all. <laughs> all right, so hopefully you had enough time for that. This is me. I'm doing consulting work with school districts. I'm just starting, but if you want me to come in, what I'm about is empowering you. We don't come with a, with a, with our, here's our curriculum, do that, it works. Hell no. It works because you, work it, you, you get the funds of knowledge from your community and the resources of your students, and you put it in action, and that's what we did. So um, sometimes it's super popular with some superintendents, and sometimes it ain't. So if you know some folks, shout out. Otherwise, shout me out anyway, just as a homie. And one last thing here. It's impossible to teach without the courage to love. Take that with you the rest of today. Take that with you to your classroom. Take that with you to your community. Take that with you tonight with the people you love. It was an honor to be with you. Let's clap it up one more time. Isan Barsak! Isan Barsak! Isan Barsak! Can't stop, won't stop.